Welcome to the very last episode of 12 Integrals. And it wouldn't really be a series about calculus if I never once mentioned the greatest use of calculus in modern world. And that is use of calculus in physics. Now physics involves lots and lots of calculus. And that shouldn't really be a surprise to anybody. I mean, one of the co-creators of calculus was the same man who formulated a lot of classical physics and a lot of the physics that we now know today. Calculus is one of those tools that is rather necessary in order for you to do physics. Without calculus, it's probably really difficult to come up with a lot of principles in physics that you have today. Now there's loads and loads of topics that I could have talked about which will involve integration slash calculus and also physics. But the topic that I'm going to be talking about today in this video is one that I wanted to do for quite a while now, and that is about rockets. So let's imagine a rocket filled with fuel floating around in space. How can we get that rocket to start accelerating and moving forward? I mean, there are no roads in space and there's pretty much no air in space as well. So rockets can't really move the same way as a car or an airplane. Instead, the way that the rocket will move itself will have to rely on something called the conservation of momentum. Now there's this thing in physics called momentum, which is defined as the mass of a particular object times the velocity of that particular object. Now this weird thing called momentum somehow is conserved in an isolated system. In other words, if you have a system and there's nothing else acting upon that system, no external forces on that system, then the total momentum of that particular system will stay the same regardless of the time. Even if the bodies within that system collide with each other or something, for example, the total momentum will still be the same before and after the collision, given that there's no external force from another source acting on those objects. Here's another example for conservation of momentum, which is a bit closer to what we're looking for. Let's say you're standing on an ice rink holding a basketball, and we'll assume that the ice rink is perfectly smooth. There's no frictional force that will be acting upon you. Let's say initially you're holding the basketball and you are still. The momentum of you and the basketball will be zero because neither of you is moving and so you have a velocity of zero. But now let's say you take the basketball and you throw it in one direction. Suddenly the basketball will gain some momentum. But according to the conservation of momentum, momentum of the system must be conserved at any time. And so initially there was no momentum, but then after you throw the ball, the ball gains some momentum. And so somehow the momentum must still remain equal to zero at that particular moment, which means that you also have to be moving away in the opposite direction. So that momentum of you and the momentum of the ball cancels each other out and the momentum still remains at zero. And so by you throwing the ball in one direction, it also causes you to move in the other direction as well. But how is this going to help us solving the problem of the rocket? Well, let's go back and look at the rocket again. Remember what I said earlier, is that the rocket is filled with fuel, and rockets will obviously have an engine at the end, which is able to fire these fuels out of the back. And so what happens is that what the rocket can do is the rocket can shoot fuel out of the end of the rocket, which will cause these fuel expelled from the rocket to go out in one direction, and because of conservation of momentum, the rocket then must also be pushed in the opposite direction, hence going forward. Similar to what happens when you throw the ball in one direction and you move in the other direction, the rocket sort of throws some fuel in one direction and then moves forward in the other direction. And momentum of this system must be conserved. And obviously as the rocket expels more and more fuel out, it will gain more and more momentum and hence move at a faster and faster speed. But that's just the qualitative explanation of how the rocket moves. So now let's look at how we can analyze the situation quantitatively. And this is where we we'll need to use a bit of calculus and a bit of integration. So let's set up this problem properly. Let's say we have a rocket flying through empty space at a velocity 
of V0, which is the initial velocity of the rocket before its engine operates. And let's say the total mass of the rocket initially is equal to M0, which will be the mass of the rocket itself plus all the fuel that is inside the rocket. So let's say the engine of the rocket then starts to operate. That engine will expel out the fuel of the rocket and shoot that particular fuel out of the rocket at some particular velocity. And we'll say that the fuel is shot out of the rocket at some certain velocity, which I'll call V exhaust or Vx. So what I want you to find is I want you to try to find the equation of the velocity of the rocket as a function of the mass of the rocket. Or basically, the equation that you should come up with should be able to tell you how fast the rocket will be moving when the rocket is at a certain amount of mass. And yes, you will have to use conservation of momentum to work this equation out. I'll give you a bit of time, and then in just a second, I will reveal the answers. And so as I said, you will have to use conservation of momentum to work out this problem. We'll consider this whole problem in one particular time and then reconsider again for just a tiny, tiny bit of time later. So let's first consider the problem at time t. Let's say the rocket has got a mass of m and it's moving at a certain velocity of v. The momentum in this case could be easily calculated because it's just the rocket, the momentum will just equal to m. But now let's consider this situation just a tiny, tiny bit of time later, an infinitesimally small amount of time, or dt seconds later. Now after dt seconds, the rocket will have expelled out a bit of its mass, and the rocket itself will lose a bit of mass. We'll say that the rocket's mass has changed by an amount dm. And I know that we are adding dm onto this side. dm is defined as the change in the mass of the rocket. And in this case, dm will be a negative value, which means that the mass that is spewed out of the rocket will have to equal to negative dm. Now this fuel of negative dm is being expelled out from the back of the rocket at a velocity of minus v x. But do remember it was initially moving forward with the rocket as well when the rocket was moving with a velocity of v. So this bit of fuel really will not be moving at a velocity of minus vx but really be moving at a velocity of v minus vx because of how it initially already was moving at a velocity of v but was only shot at a certain velocity minus vx. And the rocket, obviously, will have to also be moving a bit faster. And we'll say that the new velocity of the rocket is now v plus dv, where dv is just this tiny change of the rocket's velocity. And so now we can work out the new momentum of this system. The total momentum of this system will be the momentum of the rocket, which will equal to this, plus the momentum of that bit of fuel that was expelled out through the back, which will equal to this. And so this is the total momentum of the system now. But do remember the conservation of momentum. Because there's no external force, these two frames here should both have the same momentum, which means that these two expressions here must be equal to each other. And so what we can do now is we can expand all of these brackets, cancel a few things out, and then we'll be left with this expression. Now, because dm and dv are two really, really, really small quantities, when you have dm multiplied with dv, you'll have a really, 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 really small quantity. So small that it wouldn't really affect our calculations in any way. So what I'll just do is I'll just get rid of this bit here. And final rearrangements and we're left with this equation. I'll do a bit more rearrangements so that all the m's and dm's are on the same side, like this. And so now comes that little bit of integration that you need to do today. Of course, I have to put some integration in here, guys. And so what we're going to do is we're going to integrate one side here, just with respect to v, and then we're going to integrate the other side here with respect to m like this. But one more thing that we do need is we need the limits of integration. Since we in fact do know the initial and final conditions of the system that we're trying to solve. Initially I did give you the initial conditions of the rocket. That initially the rocket has a mass of m0 and is traveling forward at a velocity of v0. And so after some time the rocket will be moving at a velocity of v which is 3 that we're interested in finding and also has a mass 
of m, which is the mass of the rocket at the moment that we're interested in. So our two limits of integration will be from this initial condition all the way to this moment of time which we are interested in. And so we can put the limits of integration in. We can integrate dm going from m0 to m, and we can integrate v going from v0 to v, integrating both of these sides from its initial conditions all the way to the final instance that we are interested in. And this is a pretty standard integration. You could probably try to verify it yourself, but you will come out to this very answer. We will get v equal to v0 plus vx times natural log of m0 divided by m. And there you go. This equation gives you the information about the movement of this rocket. It basically tells you how fast the rocket will be moving when the rocket has got a particular amount of mass left. And this equation in fact does have a name. It's called Tilkovsky's rocket equation, named after the Russian scientist Konstantin Tilkovsky. And even though the equation only really holds for a really specific idealized case of a moving rocket, it still remains a really interesting exercise into investigating the whole idea of conservation of momentum. But anyways, this is all we have time for today. Thank you very much for watching pretty much the entire episode of 12 Integrals. And I'm hoping to see you guys again soon, sometime in the future. Goodbye.